used those hands to haul in more marks than any player in the history of the AFL. Welcome, Stuart Lowe. You're the owner of the safest pair of hands I've ever seen in football. Thanks, Mike. Great to be here, mate. Gee, they're large, aren't they? Yeah, they're a bit crooked and bent. They are. I noticed there's a, <laughs> you must have miscued a couple of marking attempts. Yeah, there's quite a few and uh, yeah, a few defenders' fists on the back of them as well. <laughs> I remember, I don't know if you remember, I was working at the Sunday Age about 30 years ago and Steve Perkin got you in and we put an actual life-size picture of your hand on the back page of the piss column. Do you remember that? I certainly do, Mike, yes. It nearly filled it up, didn't it? Uh, it did, yes, and I, uh, I remember for weeks after that article went out, I had to, uh, I, you know, that, that was basically the start of me having to show my hands to just about every person I walked <laughs> past. More than 2,500 marks in your career, an average of eight a, eight a week. Now, you know who the challenger is? I think that mark will stand forever, the way the game is being played now, but there's one challenger left. Do you know who it is? I reckon it's my big mate uh, who wears number 12 down at St Kilda. That's him. He might catch you. He'll play next year. Yeah, but he takes a lot on his chest. Up here. So um, I reckon I'll still take, have the uh, the record. But no, look, uh, certainly, and, and you know what a what a magnificent you know, person to hand over the mm. record to. Nick might say though that he gets to the contest quicker than you did. That you needed to do the no. the stand and wrestle. Yeah, no doubt about that. No <laughs> doubt about that. You mentioned how good he's been, and, and and we all know we all acknowledge his contribution to St Kilda. Where does he sit amongst the great players that you've? played and seen at St Kilda and that includes Lockett and Harvey and Burke and people of that ilk. I was fortunate enough in his second year um, to be up in Sydney when he took that yep. now famous uh, chess mark running, running back in the flight of the ball you know as a, I think maybe an 18 and a half year old or 19 year old kid and uh, to, to me that typifies him. I had uh, during those times I had Stevie Baker living with me and I quite often, you know, come down and he he had a, a, a room out the back of my place and uh, I, I'd wander in and Rui would be in there in bed with Steve, just you know, just in the same bed with Steve, just just sitting on top of the sheets <laughs> and and watching a video. But he was just <laughs> infectious. You mm. just wanted to be around him and and from a very early age, uh, you could just tell he was going to be a natural born leader. So you were a great at the St Kilda Football Club, but you should have played at Hawthorne, shouldn't you? Oh look, there was a, there was a. A chance there early on. Um, as a 15-year-old youngster, uh, they signed me up uh, when I was living down at Frankston Way or down at Mount Eliza Way. Um, Hawthorne had the opportunity to sign up five youngsters as they were losing the zone the following year. So, yeah, look, maybe, maybe once upon a time I, I could have. But, but it was closer than that. You were in the Crimin squad, weren't I you? I was in the Crimin squad. Yeah. Um, I'd actually broken my jaw in a motorbike accident. Uh, the month beforehand when I was invited down to some trial games, so I missed the trial games and my first game back after the broken jaw was against Marcelin College in 1984. Um, a very big, uh, at the time, uh, captain of Victoria, Steve Silvani, he was playing centre forward and uh, the coach threw me the opportunity to go and play on him, so I played centre half back on SOS and uh, I had a bike helmet that mum made me wear. Because so of the jaw. Because yeah. of the jaw. So six foot four, you know, <laughs> pimply faced kid <laughs> with a lot of puppy fat running around with a bike helmet on, playing against the, the uh, you know, the, the uh, Teal Cup captain of Victoria. Mm -hmm. uh, it wasn't a pretty sight and uh, we got smashed and Yabby uh, rang me on the way home. Alan and Jeans had been Alan, at the game. Alan Jeans had been at the yep. game and, yep. and uh, thanked me very much and wished me all the best for my football career. So that was it. So that he'd, was he'd it. made the decision on what he'd seen that day that they wouldn't go on with you. Yes, yeah. yes. So the St Kilda journey, it, uh, lots of thrills along the way, lots of personal highlights for you. I suspect that the 1997 year is the one that lives in your memory the most vividly, does it? When, when you probably should have won the Premiership. Yeah, look, Mike, we... we we didn't start the season off very well at all. We had, um, you know, I was a party to many crisis meetings down at St Kilda, but we we, uh, we had a pretty on, honest and open discussion. Um, might have been round three, of, round four. I, you know, we were three, Norton three or Stan Ells was the coach. Stan was the coach. Um, he said, "Boys, listen, you know, uh, I want you guys to have a chat. Um, if I'm not the right person for the job and I can't take you forward, let me know." We uh, we sat down for you know five or six minutes and 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 nutted out a few things and and realised that we just uh, you know we, we we couldn't blame anyone else but bar ourselves and just needed to continue to work harder and you know we uh, we just started to get the belief and uh, and got on a 
got on a, a terrific roll. You did turn it around, didn't you? I mean, in fact, you get to September, and I suspect, in retrospect, that you were probably the best team in the competition, and then things went awry in terms of injuries and bad luck. I know the first final you played was against Brisbane at Waverley. You lost Spider Everett that day with a broken collarbone. Yeah, we did, we did. Spider went down. Um, I ended up doing a fair bit of ruck work that, that day, and uh, we, uh, we had a great win. Um, probably expected to win that game mm. and, uh, and comfortably won that game and got the week off um, to play uh, North Melbourne on a Friday night. Um, and uh, certainly that week was, was, was tremendous. So no Everett, and then you lose. Now, Laser Vitovic to the people outside St Kilda is not a legendary name. Well, not for his ruck work anyway. But he was, a, he was another loss for you, and a critical loss, wasn't he? Look, Lazar was, he, he was your old fashioned and probably one of the last um, of the old fashioned typical enforcers. You know, the eyes would roll back and you just didn't know what, what, he, was, mm. what he was going to do. And uh, that certainly transpired um, in the way he went about it. And, and I think the respect his opposition had. So let's go into grand final week. You're playing Adelaide, you've lost your two best ruckmen. Then Nicky Winmar has a family bereavement. Nicky's father dies grand final week, correct? Yes. Yeah. That threw him out. There's no doubt about that. I think his father died two or three days before the granny. Yeah. Or wasn't discussed with the playing group. Wasn't, um, you know, everybody knew there was an issue, but um, it was, you know, certainly impacted probably on Nicky. Um, but we, we, you know, we tried to keep it all in house and and as normal as possible, as, as normal as you can yep. in the grand final week. We're talking about keeping things in-house. You kept in-house, didn't you? You had a personal crisis of your own on grand final leave. Yeah, look, uh, yes, I did. Um, yeah, look, I, I had an issue with a family member. I'm, I'm not going to go into it, Mike, but suffice to say that, uh, yeah, it was uh, a pretty harrowing Friday night um, lead-up to the grand final. I understand your sense of privacy. You've always been private about this, but... My understanding is, and I'll, I'll bow to your wishes here, but that you spent Friday night, the entire night, at a hospital. Seeing a loved one in intensive care, um, hooked up to monitors, uh, yeah, was, was, was pretty tough and, mm. and, and probably not ideal, but I'm in no way at all um, making any excuse or, or, or you know, it's, that, that's happened and I know, as I a understand family that. we've dealt with it. And, yeah, I'm, yeah, and I'm not going to probe you on that, but, but it's not the ideal way to go into a grand final. In, in fact, did you, ring, did you ring Stan Elves early on the morning grand final day and say you weren't sure you could play? No, no. That's not true? No, no. I was always, I was always at 100%. So I think my, my memory is you had about 10 disposals in the granny and kicked two goals. How did you think you played? Oh, terrible. Terrible. Yeah. I, I, uh, I think, and hindsight's fantastic. Um, you know, we we felt we felt that we had arrested the momentum in the second quarter mm -hmm. and played some reasonable footy, and uh, probably didn't quite put them away. Um, I think I'll keep the first goal after half time to put us maybe. So you were 13 up at half time. Yep. So we're close to 20 points mm -hmm. up. Um, it was one of those games that. There wasn't one defining moment. It just it just unravelled, and it was it was just a slow death. And and we believed in what we were doing um, so much that we we just you know, wrongly assumed that it was going to turn, and we were going to get our opportunity. Um, in retrospect, you know, I kick myself, and I have sleepless nights. I had sleepless nights about why didn't I throw myself behind the ball? Mm. Why didn't I demand to go into the ruck like I'd done so many other times? Um, you know, why did I just stand and, w and, and watch it all uh, unfold the way it did? There you are on the ground after the game in obvious pain and distress. I mean, how long does it take for that feeling, the wounds to heal? I look for, for the, uh, the many hundreds and hundreds of AFL players who have been through the system and not tasted that ultimate glory, um, and then to get that close. Um, and still not taste it. Um, you know, I, I love the grand final. I love footy. I love going every year. Um, and it does. It just burns. And, and I don't think you ever will. As a, as a as a sportsman, as a elite sportsman, you know, the, the the pain subsides, but the memories come back. Even when people talk about it, and 
and the what ifs. Mm. And I don't have too many what ifs in my life, but that's the big one that just burns in your gut. And there's nothing we can do about it. No, there's not. But do you think it's the, should you have won that year? Should you have been the best team that year and, and by extension won the flag? Absolutely. Absolutely. I don't mean to make this a nightmare, but Darren Charman, you were sort of a fair way away from him when he was turning on his show in the last quarter, but that was, uh, he was unstoppable, wasn't he? Yeah, look, he was, and look, you know, he's a, he was and is and was a tremendous player. And look, Jamie was no doubt our best matchup on him. No doubt at all. There was no, no way you could, you mm. know, single out and blame a defender for, you know, for, for not doing the job on, on one particular person. You know, what, what do you say to someone like, Jamie Shanahan had been a really good player that year for you at fullback. And as you said, he was the logical matchup. He would have been disconsolate at the finish. Well, you're all feeling the pain, but I mean, he's the man who's played on the bike, who's won the game. Do you remember how, how he coped with it at the finish? Oh, look, like us all, we, we were just absolutely gutted and shattered. And, uh, you know, he was one of, he's one of my, still is one of my best mates. And, uh, you know, it's not, not something that we, we talk about openly and, and, and bring up that often. Mm. Um, but, uh, look, he had the full support of, of everyone at the footy club and it was, it was just... It was just not our day. No. There was a popular view, right or wrong, that the senior players at St Kilda, one of whom was you, actually squeezed Stan Elves out of the coaching position. Now, you've heard this stuff because I've, you and I have had a conversation a previous time about that. Did you blokes um, undermine the coach? Every year, uh, Don Hanley, who was the CEO at the time, um, would sit down with, uh, at that stage, it was uh, Berkey and I were the captains, uh, and Harves was the vice captain. The question was asked, um, you know, has Stan lost the playing group? This is a meeting of all the players, is it? Or no, the leadership this group? This is the leadership yeah, group. Okay. This is the three of us and, yep. and Don. And, and, our, and our comments were, um, we weren't sure. Um, there, was no, there was no push by the players or the leadership group at any at any stage at all. But, but if, you, if I heard that answer from you guys, I would say implicit in that is the view that, well, probably. There was a hell of a lot of other dialogue that was discussed um, and there was so many, so many, you know, amazing things that Stan had, had brought to the footy club and, and, and looking back over, over all the coaches that, uh, that I had, um, he's right up the top, right up the top. So your conscience is clear? The, Absolutely, yeah, okay, 100%. Okay. Talk, Stan's an interesting man in himself, we know that, but you've had Tim Watson and Malcolm Blight among your other coaches. We're all fascinated by the Blight experience at St Kilda. What, what are your recollections? My comments would be he was a man who was persuaded by the dollar, mm -hmm. who, who lacked the passion um, to probably compete in the fierceness of, 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 of the then. Yeah, yeah. I truly believe. We, we, were, we, were, uh, we were extremely frustrated. I, I, I could see the end of my career coming to a head and, and I could see it just slipping through the cracks. Um, you know, he was very much uh, a part-time coach, trying to fulfil mm. an amazing you know, position. Um, yeah, we, we, were, we were going backwards at it. So you, you, you still on the view that you're still angry about that, that there was an opportunity wasted because it was oh. an inappropriate a, appointment? Absolutely, but I don't blame Malcolm. I, bl mm. I blame, you know, I blame... It's not just his fault. The, the best intentions were, 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 uh, were obviously there, but I would have assumed that after the Tim Watson scenario with regards to an unproven, untried coach coming straight out of the media, to getting you know, a coach who really didn't want to come down, but eventually got got made that good an offer that he had to. Yeah, but didn't but on that point, and I accept that about that Tim was untried. Did they then say, okay, that's a mistake there? Let's go to a man that we know that can coach and get him in. I mean, Bloody's. I remember from the outside looking in, I thought it was really excited. I would never criticise that appointment because I thought it was fantastic for your footy club. We look. We were all we were all excited as well. We were all excited as well. But um, you know, and well, I don't think you can. I don't think you could in today's 
today's football, uh, run a pre-season with a coach coming in and spending two hours mm -hmm. at a footy club a day, three days a week. Mm -hmm. um, there was, you know, we, we, were, we, were, we were training out at Monash University. We were, doing, uh, we were doing a running session at four o'clock in the afternoon on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and we were doing a weight session at, uh, at Monash Gym on a Monday, Wednesday, Friday. We didn't touch the footies until late December and uh, it was it, we were just we were just un, underprepared. Mm. What about Tim Watson? And we talked to Tim again. I thought that appointment was at the time. I thought it was great for for your footy club. Yeah, yeah. Look, again, you know, I've got the utmost respect for Tim, and uh, and I, I I just I don't think I'm going to say anything that he hasn't said. I I, I just think um, the appointment coming from someone who. His background has been playing in media and not, not having that that um, that coaching direct coaching background. Mm -hmm. um, given where we were as a footy club and as a playing list, just totally overwhelmed him. Um, mm. You know, tactically and and what he brought to the footy club and his efforts were were amazing and unbelievable. Um, you know. Couldn't, couldn't question those. You must have felt for him too, even though things oh. were falling apart, but you know he's a likeable bloke and, and you said that, being overwhelmed. What was the sort of the fragile part of him that sort of broke down under this pressure? Look, in a small way, I've, I've coached since I finished playing and I coach a B-grade amateur footy side. Halebury? Halebury. Yep. Love it. Love what I do, love mentoring um, young men, um, but it's all consuming. Our footy club's probably at a similar stage at Harbury as to what St Kilda was at the time. We have a lot of young blokes and, and consistency of performance isn't there. And you just question yourself and you start to get those self-doubts and, and you know, again, I, I just think from experience you learn and you can cope better. So Tim hadn't had the prep? I mean, it was just... I, yeah. I don't know, yeah. Mm. Your footy club's an intriguing beast, isn't it? I mean, you're, you've had given it 17 years and you've still got an emotional attachment to it, but those of us looking from the outside, you've got one premiership in 120-odd years. Is it a blighted place, do you feel? I mean, is it are the gods against it? Look, I get angry when people talk about the culture of the footy club. Um, there's no doubt in my time we had a lot of colourful personalities, a lot of per people probably... You know, facing the wrong way in the rowing boat, and 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 really rowing against what the organisation and and the playing group were doing. What do you what do you mean by that? Um, just just people in high places. No, no, no. I'm, I'm saying at times, at times there was probably uh, there was probably guys just there for the wrong agenda. The influx of the Carlton Brigade in the in the late 80s. Um, to me, in my 17 years, um, was one of the pivotal points, and which really changed the whole makeup and, and and the way we saw ourselves at the footy club. Positive, absolutely positively. Mm. So it's Kenny Sheldon was, was Kenny the coach. Sheldon, Pete Mac McConville, yep. Spiro, Alex Marcou, Wow Jones, Wow Jones, who just was an amazing, amazing mentor to me. So they raised your standards, did they? they Absolutely, unquestionably. You had you had this group of guys that had played in successful premiership teams at Carlton come across. You know, we we just lapped it up. There's no doubt in my mind. You know, that's 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 when the footy club started to really. Well, we get talk some about that, and, and that and history proves you to be proves that to be. So, why did Kenny Sheldon get turfed out then? I think um, the well, I know the uh, the board. And the hierarchy felt that the Sheldon Hudson connection was just uh, too big, and uh, they were making too many decisions. What they had too much power. A bit too much power. Wow. Even though things were going well on the field. Yeah. When we come back, Stewie, I want to talk to you about the big offers from Frio and a Victorian club that I wasn't aware of. Mm. Mark. Stewie, the encyclopedia of AFL footballers said that you were quote. A woeful kick in your early years. Is that fair? Um, yes, yes. Yes. Okay. So yes. you line up to that. I'm comfortable with that. Okay. Uh, in your latter years, you became certainly a competent, perhaps better than that, competent kick for goal. My understanding was that Peter Hudson and Stan Elves and Ken Sheldon, 
invested a massive amount of time in you on the ground, in redefining your technique and teaching you how to kick. Is that true? Look, and, and so did my previous coaches. Doc Bulldock would, would pick me up from work um, when we were all working and uh, my lunch times were spent um, having shots of goal for him, albeit the fact that he had the races and the form guide <laughs> in his back pocket and the car, the car radio going. Hutto, uh, a couple of years later, or a year later, um, came on the scene and between um, he and myself, uh, we just, just did hours and hours and hours of practice. The Hudson theory, was it not, was everything was in a straight line? Everything was in a straight yep. line and... Did you pick a target? Theory, pick a target behind. Yep. Um, I, uh, I, I, had, I, I had a tendency to lift my head, so I think I was the first person to actually scratch a, a mark on the ground. Yep, yep you were. Um, and then I, I went back 13 paces and... Uh, to me, I had to treat it like a real golf swing mm -hmm. and just be very technical. So, very, very straight, very rigid, and low, low ball drop. Did did, did Hutto take you to training at uh, sunrise one morning, a wet day? Have you run into goal and show you your footprints to yes. convince you? Of, is that, that story's 100%. true. Yeah. Yep. There was a bloke playing out of the goal square at St Kilda at the time that wasn't a bad kick for goal. Oh. Did you ever engage with him about the technicalities of it? Um, we tried. He tried, but uh, he gave up on me. Pretty, he gave up on me pretty <laughs> early. Because yeah, he, he was, was he was probably oh, as good as kick for goal as we've ever seen. Unbelievable, unbelievable. The, the, funnily enough, the, the the shot he had for goal up in Sydney to break the record was probably the worst kick yeah. he'd done. What about his aura, Stewie? About around the footy club, you you played years and years with him, and just he's at an exalted level, isn't he, in, in football history? Yeah. Certainly in St Kilda's history. Look, there's no doubt. There's no doubt the move to Sydney helped him um, tremendously. He was he was hating footy in the end down here. Um, yeah, you know, the year he won the the Brownlow, he was he was he was always just a trainer. But when the balls came out or when he had to compete, you know, he he trained at the intensity that he he played. Mm -hmm. um, the year he won the Brownlow, his second half of the year, he was best on track every night. You uh, you were nearly lost to St Kilda in the mid nineties, weren't you? Fremantle all came a knocking with a big checkbook. Did you get close to uh, to I got, going I west? Got, I got close enough to be to be picked up and and taken over um, to actually have a look around. I must admit, um, within a day of being over at West, I knew it wasn't for me and I knew my heart was always back at the footy club. Um, and it was about three days later, I was at the uh, at the tab down at Sandy and Noel Judkins walked in and we started having a chat. It was Noel Judkins was at Essendon, at the Essendon, recruiting manager? At Essendon. He just grabbed me and said, you know, would you be willing to have a chat to Sheets? Um, can I get your number? And uh, he rang me that night and we had a meeting on the Monday Without even saying a word, um, he just held up a, a magnet board with uh, with all the Essendon team and had Paul Salmon at full forward and had Stuart Lowe at, at centre forward. So I probably considered the Essendon offer more so than the Fremantle offer. Um, but again, again, um, you know, a really good mate of mine, Trevor Barker, was back at the footy club mm. and we'd been having some really good dialogue and... Uh, he was the first person I told that no, I'm staying. You know, he, he always said to me, you know, there is there is a there is value in being a, a one club man. So. There's no more loyal person than Trevor Barker, oh, was there? No, oh. amazing. Was there a moment when you when in your gut you said, I think I might do this? Absolutely. There was. I, I left that meeting um, wanting to play for the Bombers. Yep. Wow. Yep. You glad you stayed? You glad? Abs you st look, absolutely. I certainly appreciated listening and, uh, and and having a look around, but no, I was very comfortable in, in my decision. The decision. Tell me the secret, apart from the fact you've got these massive plates of meat on the end of your arms, what was your secret in a marking contest? Eyes on the footy, positioning, strength, what was it? It was, it was understanding where the ball was going to drop and, and hitting it at the highest point possible. Um, before your opposition, so um, it was just fixating on the footy mm. and and just hitting the ball and going and, and, and having inertia, having having body having your body going through the ball. I see I see so many guys nowadays wait 
and caress the ball into them rather than actually hitting and going yep. through the balls. You, you went to 34, which is a long career, 17 seasons at AFL level. Were you done? Absolutely. Yeah. Ironically, um, the the day I decided it was enough, we'd, we'd, we'd had a loss. Um, we were down at the Brighton Bars, Sea Bars, uh, on a wet, cold, shitty Monday night. We had to tread water uh, for 27 minutes because we were 27 shy of our target one percenters. And I've looked at the water. I'm 34 years old. <laughs> I run a business. I've just, I just normally eat this stuff up and I just don't want to do this. I turned around, I said to the boys, I'm done. Drove back, rang Tomo on the way. He was still back at the club. I said, um, I, need a, I need a chat. Uh, went up to Tomo's office, sat down. I said, mate, I'm done. I am cooked. Um, I, you know, I, I, I've loved every moment of this and I love training and I love the preparation and, and I, just, I just can't do it anymore. I drove home. And, uh, and within sort of 10 minutes of getting home, um, the phone started to ring. Tom had been on the phone to a few of the boys. Um, 20 of them arrived around. Really? We had pizzas. Um, we, uh, we had a couple of beers. And, uh, and Tom had talked me around to play out the season, which was the best thing. It was like um, every training session, every time I walked onto a different oval it was just I just appreciated everything and I really like farewell to it I really enjoyed it I yeah. really enjoyed it I know it was probably self-indulgent um, but it helped my footy and I probably played uh, the best footy of my year on those last six games I think you've made a massive contribution to the St Kilda Football Club games goals and awards and uh, you've always represented them well and you should be proud of your contribution to the Saints and to footy generally good to see you and well played thanks Mike